everyone. I'm going to go ahead and call to order the regularly scheduled meeting of the Alexander County Board of Education for November 6th of 2017 to order. I want to welcome you all here. Um, thank you for coming, and I'd like everyone to recognize a brief moment of silence, and in particular, if you could remember board member Sally Artis and her husband, who has some health problems. Thank you. We have a special guest tonight. We have Macy Marie Byers, and she is an outstanding sixth grader at West Alexander Middle School in Ms. Kaler's classroom, and she's the daughter of Anita Roop and Bobby Byers. She's the granddaughter of Ruthie and Larry Roop, and she has three sisters, Maggie, Dixie, and Miranda. Macy, would you come forward and lead us in our pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you Macy. <laughs> Good job. Board members, you've had a chance to look over the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion, deletions, additions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. And now I'd like to recognize Dr. Jennifer Hefner for our honors and recognition. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board Members. It is always my pleasure to present the honors and recognition portion of the board meeting each month. We will start tonight by recognizing two art winners. In the spring, Appalachian State University's Public School Partnership requested two pieces of art from each district, one from a rising fourth to eighth grader and one for a rising ninth to twelfth grader. Those art pieces were to be displayed for the 2017-18 school year in the New Reich College of Education building located on the campus in Boone. Each of our elementary schools were given the opportunity to submit an art piece from their school that met the criteria. Each middle school was given the opportunity to submit an art piece from each of the two age categories in their school that met the criteria and each of the high schools could submit two pieces from each grade level. All of these art submissions were displayed within the case, located in the lobby of the auditorium, and a committee chose a winner from each category. The two winners' art pieces were framed and hung in the building last month, and the winners and their families were invited to attend a reception last Friday night at Appalachian State University. Board member Marty Pennell, will you come help make these presentations? Alexander County Schools was represented for the fourth to eighth grade age group by Amarina, Amar Amarina, okay, good, Chapman. Amarina is in the seventh grade at East Alexander Middle School. She's the daughter of Andrew Chapman and the granddaughter of Jean and Nadine Chapman. There is a slide of Amarina's piece on the screen and the originals were hung at Appalachian State University. Amarina, if you would please come forward, let's give her a round of applause. Alexander County Schools was, represent, was represented for the 9th to 12th grade age group by Brianna Friday. Brianna is in the 10th grade at Alexander Early College. She's the daughter of Burke and Heather Friday, and there is a slide of her piece of artwork on the screen at this time. Please come forward, Brianna Friday. Thank you. 
Audience, please give these art winners another round. Yeah. And I periodically go to Boone for a superintendent's meeting, and I can't wait to find your artwork on the walls up there. Good job. They're by the elevator. They're where? By the elevator. On the ground floor as you go in, second floor. I'll make sure I go see them. Thank you. Harry Shrum, will you help me with the next presentation? During the summer months, I always make an announcement that the Bright Ideas grant applications are available to teachers. Last week, the 2017 Energy United Bright Ideas grant recipient was recognized, and that grant recipient was Brian Smith, teacher at Wittenberg Elementary School. Is Brian here tonight? I don't see him. He was planning to be here? Okay, all right. Brian was also Alexander County's Teacher of the Year, he teaches a kindergarten first grade combination class at Wittenberg Elementary School. The grant that he wrote was titled All Boys Book Club and it's for a Saturday morning boys reading club. And even though he's not here tonight, let's give him a round of applause. Well, if he's not too late, we'll do a brief. <laughs> we'll just pretend we didn't even do that. So, Mr. Shrum, I'll need you again. At this time, I would like for Bridget Ryan, president of the Alexander County Public Education Foundation, to come forward and make some presentations. started with our presentations, I would like to introduce the foundation members, and I'm not sure, I know I have one here. Um, we have Vice President Shannon Presnell, Treasurer Dennis Smart, Secretary Misty Oxentheim, Anna Ferguson, Andy Anderson, Kim Mitchell, Phil Eichard, Deborah Watts, Dana Benfield, Gordon Knight, and Sally Hargis. Um, so, Gordon, will you help me with these presentations too? I also want to thank our selection committee that included Gordon, uh, Sally Hardis, and Dana Benfield, and, and they take time to read your grants and uh, select them and, and uh, make sure that they're worthy of the <coughs> uh, grants that we select. So I appreciate your time doing that. Thank you. Um, when I talk about each one of these grant recipients, I'm just going to list some, read some excerpts from what you presented in the grant because that gives you a little bit more idea of what the grants about than me standing up here saying it because some of them are just a little bit over my head on some parts of it. <laughs> um, so the first one is to Mr. Tyler Mitchell and he submitted a grant entitled Safety in the Shop Air Purification. The addition of an air purification system to the shop will make the environment for students safer, more enjoyable, and more appropriate for learning. All students deserve to have clean air at school and keep them healthy now and in the future. Ultimately, our goal for this project is to keep students safe and give them a better experience in the shop areas. Congratulations, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. J.D. Sink is requesting the assistance of the <coughs> foundation to help purchase additional FFA official dressed uniforms to have needed sizes available to long students. The FFA organization at Alexander Central High School does not have the needed sizes available to long our economically disadvantaged students. 
Students taking part in FFA will gain life-changing experiences that they will be able to carry on into whatever pathway they choose. By making these uniforms available, we will continue doing our part to meet the needs of our students. Ms. Erin Gates is helping students find their genius through gardening. With the support of the foundation, the 25 to 30 students in grades K through 5 active in the gardening club will have a year-long hands-on experience in science, math, engineering, <coughs> and reading. Students will be involved in every step of the process and will develop leadership skills through the, through the decision-making opportunities available in the group. This grant will provide a composting bin, materials needed to build garden beds in our school campus, gardening tools, soil, mulch, seeds, and plants. Congratulations, Ms. Gates. <laughs> Ms. Shelley Mitchell is seeking funding for science fiction literature for the English One Classroom. Alexander Central High School is committed to preparing students to be successful in a global and technology-driven society. In order to achieve this goal, students must be exposed to scientific and technology themes. This project will serve to introduce two novel sets with a primary focus on science and technology to the supplemental novel collection. With the foundation's support, over 75 students in our community will benefit this year alone. This project has the potential to reach thousands of students as the novels can be used by multiple teachers for years to come. Congratulations. With the foundation support, students at Bethlehem will be able to take virtual 3D <coughs> trips, experience virtual roller coasters, explore the coral reef, inspect ancient artifacts, etc. These are experiences that students in our rural community may not be able to have without using Google Cardboard and virtual reality. Our classrooms are in need of exciting and innovative activities to be used for STEM. These activities will allow our students to work collaboratively communicate effectively and be creative. Congratulations to Ms. Kim Hartzler for her grant titled Breakout Boxes and Google Cardboard. <coughs> grant submitted by Mr. Ramey Robinson is titled Motor Control Training Unit for ACHS Electrical Trades Lab. Alexander County is fortunate to have the Electrical Trades Program at our high school. Having updated motor control equipment in the electrical shop at Alexander Central will allow 86 students enrolled in electrical trade classes this year to have the opportunity to train on modern up-to-date controls that will make them marketable upon graduation. Local manufacturing facilities continue to need motor control experience when looking for electrical maintenance technicians. This equipment will allow our students to reach new levels of achievement in this area. Congratulations, Mr. Ball. And that's all we have. And I just want to say thank you for submitting your, your grant proposals. And um, thank you. With, without, without your submissions, we couldn't help.
too, at this time we will recognize the Energy United Bright Ideas Grant recipient. Each summer, I send out a notification that grant applications for Energy United Bright Ideas grants are available and submissions are made. <coughs> Last week, the 2017 Energy United Bright Ideas grant recipient was recognized in Alexander County. Congratulations, Mr. Brian Smith. Brian is the Alexander County Teacher of the Year, and he teaches a kindergarten first grade combination at Wittenberg Elementary School. The grant title was All Boys Book Club and is intended for a Saturday morning boys reading club. That's pretty amazing. Congratulations, Brian. That concludes our honors and recognitions, and I, we're going to enter into the business portion of our meeting. So if anybody wants to excuse themselves, you're welcome to. Thank you. Thank you for bringing her. Thank yeah, you. thank you. No one has signed up for public comment, so we will move to the consent agenda. <laughs> um, board members, you've had a chance to look over the consent agenda in your packet. Do I have a motion to, to approve those items? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion about any of the items on there? All right, all those in favor of approval of the consent agenda items as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. And we will move on to our report section, and I'll recognize Dr. Chad Maynard for our update on West Alexander Middle School. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, I'm again saying thank you. Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Member of the Board, uh, Members of the Board, Dr. Hefner, uh, for allowing me the opportunity to uh, speak with you this evening and share with you just a few of the great things going on at West Alexander Middle School as we uh, move into the second nine weeks of the school year. item I'd like to share with you is of course to dis discuss uh, our student uh, performance or school performance. As you know, met West Alexander Middle School met expected growth this uh, school year for the 2016 school year. Uh, the previous three years we'd exceeded growth, but it's worth noting that this year, even though we met growth, we were in a positive uh, 0.65, which meant that our students gained more than one year's growth. Uh, we've been in a positive range the last four years, and in also this year, we're in the top uh, 50 to 79.9 percent of all schools that range. I don't have the exact percent uh, currently, but we're in that range as far as all schools with our positive 0.65 uh, growth index score this year. So that's exciting. Our teachers uh, work very hard and uh, realize that uh, once you get to exceed expected growth, it's hard to stay there. So there'll be years where uh, challenges you'll run across, uh, challenges different teachers having to be out for various reasons and uh, lots of extraneous factors that come into play that don't show on uh, a score at the end of the year. But all of our teachers worked extremely hard. All of our teachers currently teaching reading or math uh, exceeded or uh, met expected growth as far as their teacher EVOS scores. And those were released uh, last week, I believe it was, uh, to uh, us and I think uh, last week as well to teachers. So excited. Our teachers worked really hard and uh, deserve to uh, receive the recognition for their hard work. Uh, 
West Alexander Middle School is a PBIS exemplar school. Uh, us and Bethlehem Elementary uh, will be recognized on November 14th. And I have the committee members there, uh, Mr. Draper, Ms. Simpson, Ms. Stocks, Ms. Storms, Ms. Kirby, Ms. Walsh, and uh, Ms. Jamie Curtis. And uh, they've all worked really hard. Uh, many of them have been on the uh, PBIS committee from its inception. And I also think it's worth uh, recognizing several others who <coughs> play a part in this process. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to arrive, I think, in year two of the PBIS process. Uh, the previous year, Ms. Gant, Mr. Palmer uh, moved forward with that process. They looked at their data and could tell that they needed to uh, address the, the behavior piece and did an outstanding job of that. Uh, Mr. Evans and Mr. Palmer as well continued to serve in the PBAS co-chair uh, role and then Mr. Draper picked up the role last year and just continued to uh, hit the ground running and continued to work to uh, achieve uh, the exemplar status. There's a lot of paperwork, uh, a lot of data goes into that process and I would also like to recognize uh, Melissa Dunn for her support to Mr. Draper and the other PBAS committee members uh, during that process. So we're excited for them, uh, we had a celebration on the early release uh, a couple Fridays ago uh, to give staff uh, lunch and the WPA as well as some shirts recognizing their efforts. So I just want to uh, recognize everybody for their hard work going all the way back to Ms. Gant, Ms. Palmer, and Mr. Evans. We had a uh, North Carolina Science Teacher of the Year for District 7. Ms. Jody Fry was a North Carolina Science Teacher of the Year for District 7. Uh, she received that award on October 19th at the Science Teachers uh, Award Ceremony in Greensboro, and I had the pleasure of attending that ceremony. And uh, Ms. Uh, Fry certainly rep represented West as well as Alexander County Schools extremely well. Uh, during last year's uh, testing year, she teaches eighth grade science. Uh, she had a heterogeneous group of approximately 102 students. And of those 102 students, I believe 101 of those students past the eighth grade EOD. <coughs> that includes kids from AIG to EC and a variety of needs. So she had a 99% in the end, 99% of her students passed at grade level proficient. And of those, 87.4% passed at college and career ready, uh, which is a level four or five. So uh, that in and of itself, as well as the uh, additional duties she serves with student uh, council and other roles there at West uh, make her very deserving We're uh, lucky to be the recipients of the Trout in the Classroom project. This project is funded by Trout Unlimited. Uh, Mr. Rao, uh, many of you may have been in his classroom. His is the classroom with all the uh, animals and deer heads and all the other items in the classroom as well as several aquariums. Uh, Mr. Rao applied in the spring and was the lucky recipient. And uh, in September, uh, we received 150 trout eggs. I believe uh, we're projected difficult to count at this time, but rejecting well over 100 of those have hatched. And in the spring, uh, sometime around March, uh, his class, as well as uh, uh, the other sixth grade class, will be traveling to Stone Mountain to release those in, uh, into the, the streams up at Stone Mountain. The project was completely funded from the uh, chiller to the water quality test, food, everything's been completely uh, funded with the project, and it fit nicely with the sixth grade curriculum as far as uh, conservation and ecosystems. So he's done an outstanding job. There was a little scare when the power was out. Uh, I actually had to pull a generator in to keep the temperature uh, levels monitored, but uh, I <laughs> think we were able to pull through that little stand, uh, well, I guess, last week, and uh, so he's done an outstanding job, and we're excited for that. Another update, uh, Mr. Rao also was the winner last year of the North Carolina Beautiful Grant uh, as a result of his uh, efforts. We are the proud home to 23 hens and one rooster who are currently <laughs> laying approximately seven dozen eggs per week with projections ranging from 10 to 12 dozen. Uh, if you need any eggs, they are now three dollars a dozen and you can purchase those at West on a uh, regular basis. So we welcome your business as it's generated approximately $117 uh, towards our school science funds. Uh, the students uh, and that's after expenses uh, the students uh, are responsible for feeding, feeding and watering the chickens as well as uh, gathering the eggs daily. So they've uh, taken it upon themselves uh, last year and are moving strong this year to keeping that project up and going. And uh, we're excited about uh, 
all that it may entail in the future. They stood the storms uh, the other week, so Mr. Rowell may move into uh, uh, storm-proof uh, chicken house construction because aside from a few uh, leaning T-posts, which uh, Mr. Stone and I put back in, we're in good shape as far as the chickens go. So we're excited yeah. about that and uh, proud of Mr. Uh, Rowell. Uh, we had uh, actually two uh, ASU summer we reading winners. Uh, Jordan Evans, a seventh grade student, was the winner and was recognized at ASU on October uh, 21st at the post halftime of the Coastal Carolina game. Uh, there's a picture of her and her uh, little sister and her family, and that's a great day. I had the pleasure of attending uh, several years uh, previously, and it's a great time. They get to interact with the players, uh, tour the facility, have a lunch. So uh, you can tell they were enjoying their day in Boone that day. Also, Dr. Price, I get one too early. Dr. Price, seventh grade class, was the uh, high student participation award winner, and uh, we're in the process of coordinating a date with uh, ASU for a visit from Yosef in the very near future. And I'd like to uh, recognize Ms. Kim Lohman as our media coordinator, Ms. Jamie Curtis, for coordinating that effort, which actually started last spring as she encouraged students to participate, getting all the materials out to students. So they did an outstanding job promoting that and a special shout out to Jordan for uh, being the middle school winner. The next slide is entitled Facing the Storm. As many of you uh, know, uh, Monday, October 23rd was a little different uh, day uh, as an administrator and as a resident of Alexander um, County. Uh, throughout the day, beginning I'd say a little midday, we were under a watch and followed the appropriate pr protocols uh, that evening for us, uh, we had a uh, course concert that was going to begin, I believe, around 6.30, uh, but it uh, didn't quite work out that way because about uh, 4.30 or whatever the exact time with is, Dr. Griffin could probably share better than me, but uh, uh, we were went into a warning, uh, and uh, at that time, uh, notified staff to take appropriate uh, safety procedures and get to the safest locations in the school. It was a very eye-opening experience uh, for me. Uh, it's one thing to, you know, you see storms and stuff come around, but uh, it's quite the other uh, responsibility when you're responsible for about uh, 75 other people's children as well as the adults in the building and taking on that and looking out the window. Mr. Draper was there as well as, um, I'll recognize the, the names of those that were there. Uh, myself, Mr. Draper, uh, of course. Uh, Mr. Howell was actually on a bus with a student in the Ellendale community when the storm came through. Coach Key was with the girls basketball team in the locker room. Ms. Simpson uh, was working late on the I or paperwork uh, in her new role in eighth grade. Mr. Stone had arrived back from the buses, so he was in the building. Uh, Mr. Walker was assistant to uh, Coach Key in basketball. Mr. Chandler with wrestling. Ms. Noble was there actually tutoring her student. Ms. Debbie Shrum uh, was in the office, as well as Ms. Calhoun. Ms. Storms was uh, there with her, uh, her daughter who was uh, uh, who gets off the bus there and she was working on some uh, things in preparation for the next day. Uh, Ms. Brashears, our cheerleading coach, and not pictured, uh, Ms. Walsh, the other cheerleading coach, as well as Ms. Krause and her young son, Riker, were all in the building. And uh, they all did an outstanding job and deserve uh, uh, lots of recognition for their efforts uh, because that was uh, Scary, scary time. Uh, we did have some damage, but when you drove around the community, we were blessed in relation to where a lot of uh, other community members suffered. But uh, we'd like to recognize uh, them for doing an outstanding job. Going the extra mile. Uh, as we all know bus drivers are uh, a, uh, at a shortage and uh, getting harder and harder to find each day. And we'd like to recognize uh, seven of our full-time certified staff members. Uh, Mr. Matt Cochran, Mr. Tupper Howell, uh, Ms. Ashley Huss, Mr. Josh Stone, uh, Ms. Loretta Thomas, Mr. Adam Walker, and Ms. Jackie Worley. In addition to their teaching responsibilities, they either drive or monitor a bus each day, which allows us to uh, get students to and from school. And uh, that's certainly not something that's required as part of their job description, but they're willing to, to do it uh, for uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of money. But uh, to do it to <coughs> see that the children get there each day. So I think they deserve some recognition. And the, uh, the next to last slide, uh, just like to uh, 
take this opportunity to recognize all the great staff that we have at uh, West Alexander Middle School, uh, from our classroom teachers, uh, from across all grade levels, exploratory teachers, our office staff, our uh, media technology specialists, custodians, EC staff, cafeteria staff, school counselor, instructional coach, Mr. Draper, uh, does an outstanding job each and every day, as well as Ms. Rum in the, the office. And, uh, we're just blessed to have lots of great staff. And, in this position, it doesn't take long to learn how very critical that is, how much they make your job either uh, so much easier or so much harder. And uh, I'm blessed to have a lot of staff that make my job so much easier. They do a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Uh, they've had a positive attitude. We've hit the ground running this year with some of the learning focus modules, uh, looking at some plan book EDU and how we're um, uh, inst doing our providing instruction during intervention and enrichment and trying to get the biggest bang for our buck and having lost some uh, positions where we could dedicate and double dip kids previously that I've spoken to you about we're no longer able to do that so we're having to work I guess smarter in the sense that we're making the use of our time uh, attending the PD and learning focus modules that Dr. Curry's provided have been a great uh, asset and uh, have continued to learn and grow as professionals so it's been it's been good uh, it hasn't been without bumps each year I do my own survey of the staff and Family is something that comes up, a family atmosphere and so forth. And uh, this year it's been a lot like families getting started. It's not been without a few bumps. Some days you uh, you may not always like your family, but you always love them. And uh, that's the way it's been from time to time. But we've worked through the bumps and, uh, you know, in the end, they all put children first and work really hard. So I just want to give them a, a big shout, shout out to all the staff there. So if you have the opportunity, closing, I just want to say thanks to the Board of Education as well as the district level uh, leadership team members. I missed some thanks on the slides earlier as far as facing the storm. Uh, Dr. Griffin, I'd like to thank him for his assistance that day in uh, addressing the weather and uh, checking on us that evening. Uh, Dr. Helton was there. She assisted redirecting some parents that didn't get a message because posting the course cancellation on Facebook uh, was not high on the priority list uh, uh, once the storm Hit. There's other things on, and she did a great job as well as Mr. Roney and uh, so many others, Chad Pennell, uh, Russell Green. I talked to lots of others that I probably left off some there, but I uh, would like to recognize them. So thank you. And uh, I've included a, uh, a hot link to the October 16th edition of WAMS TV for your viewing pleasure whenever you have time, as well as a link to the, the West Alexander Middle School Facebook page uh, at your convenience. And hopefully, I haven't went much over my 10 minute window. I want to say uh, thank you again. If there are any comments, questions, concerns, or otherwise, I welcome those. I think you do a great job, and thank particularly you. in that, that during that storm, it was, I'm sure, extremely stressful uh, for, for all of us. But when you're responsible for someone else's children, it probably makes it a little more yeah. so. Puts a new dimension on it. Anyway. It does. And, uh, the warnings and watches, uh, they'll have a new dimension as well, because sometimes it's in Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Dr. Griffin for an update on digital learning and technology. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Hefner, uh, thank you for giving me a couple minutes of your time this evening to talk about something that's really near and dear to my heart, uh, and that's our technology within our school system. Uh, several years ago, when taking this position, I was challenged uh, to lead up uh, that department and uh, bring some uh, change uh, to our school system, uh, hopefully in a, in a positive manner. And uh, by doing that, I'd like to start by recognizing uh, those folks around me. As Dr. Maynard uh, just alluded to, uh, any organization is, is run by those around you. And uh, if you're successful, it's because you have wonderful people uh, that surround you and, and what you do and what you believe in. And uh, I certainly have that. So I'm very proud of uh, the people within our organization, uh, the 
people that make things happen on a daily basis. Uh, first of all, Kim Bishop is my lead specialist, and uh, Kim is probably more than a specialist. Uh, uh, she's my right-hand person, and I'm able to communicate with her on a daily basis, uh, take advice, uh, talk about things, and figure out what it is that we need. And I'm certainly grateful for all that she does for our school system. Uh, also, Mr. Jeremy O'Brien, our uh, engineer, network engineer, uh, does a lot of behind the scenes <coughs> things. Uh, Becky Rosenberg, uh, we were able to uh, add to our staff here a couple years ago. And then Danny uh, Spikeleather also does a lot uh, behind the scenes in running our, our organization and all of our technology. Uh, here recently, we were able to add Zach Hefner, the Tech One, uh, to our organization. And Zach has uh, done a lot for us. Uh, we were able to actually consolidate several positions, and uh, he now serves uh, East uh, Alexander Middle School, uh, Bethlehem Elementary School, and Taylorsville Elementary School. So uh, many thanks to Zach. Also, our other tech assistants, uh, Tina Dermeyer, uh, Denise Rhodes, Rhonda Reinhart, Sherry Island, and uh, Cindy Rector uh, assist in all of our schools and making sure things uh, are working properly on a day-in and day-out basis. So thank you uh, to all those people. Uh, I was reading an article uh, not too long ago about uh, technology and education. Uh, and there were several facts within that article in the overview uh, that I thought pertinent to what we were going to discuss tonight. Uh, it kind of starts out with technology is everywhere. Uh, I was uh, at a, a staff development uh, earlier last week and uh, I kind of started off part of the program by telling the teachers that uh, uh, this thing called the internet uh, doesn't seem to be going away. Uh, it's not a trend. <laughs> It's not something that will be gone <coughs> tomorrow. Uh, it's changing our lives on a daily basis, uh, and so is technology. So I think uh, we have to understand it, uh, we have to develop it, and uh, we have to run with, with what it can do and how it can help our, our students uh, prepare for the real world. And in this article, it said public schools in the United States now provide at least one computer for every five students. Uh, they spend more than $3 billion per year on digital learning. Dr. Hetner was probably reading my mind the other week as she sent out an article uh, for her weekly update. Uh, and in that article, uh, there were four recent polls that parents were reported on the things that they look at uh, in a child's education. And uh, those five things were increased in equitable funding, uh, we always want more money, uh, rigorous academics, career and technical education, that's camp. Uh, number four was technology. And then next from that article found that 77% of parents and that poll, the four different polls that were put out uh, support uh, technology within their schools and providing students with laptop computers for use. Uh, I also alluded to number five, post-secondary education for their children. So technology is within everybody's scope. Uh, it's with their, within their vision of what they want for their students and it's within their vision of what they see to be successful and what a child has to be to have uh, to be successful in the real world today. Uh, where do we stack up? Alexander County Schools. Uh, I asked Danny Steichletter to uh, please put some uh, information together for me uh, and what this looked like. So I took a three year trend from 14 15 uh, to last year 16 17, and I wanted to see where it was that we were in 14 15 in the three years. Where are we now? And we were able to look at, we started out with access point upgrades. Uh, 14 15, we had 234 access points. Uh, since then, we've added 235. Desktop and laptop upgrade, 14-15, we had 552. Uh, we've added 291 uh, desktops and laptops to our district. Uh, and then Chromebook upgrades, uh, we uh, started out in 14-15 with a high school in the grant they had. 19-19 uh, they had, and we're currently uh, at 4684, adding uh, 2,765 2, Chromebooks to our district. So we've added a lot of devices. Heard some of the presentations earlier talking about STEM and things that are taking place in the classrooms, uh, and I think that the teachers are able to do that because of some of the upgrades that we've made in the past several years, uh, some of the necessary upgrades. We have a strategic plan uh, within our district, and we talk about it often within our leadership group, and it kind of keeps us on pace for what our goals are and how we need to uh, achieve those goals. Part of my goals, and one of the things through transformational technology in that strategic plan, was that infrastructure will be upgraded to support 21st century teaching and learning at a ratio of one to one at all levels. Uh, we 
we're certainly gaining on that at this point. Uh, we're currently fully one-to-one -one Chromebooks in grades 3, 12. Uh, and that's been just a short period of time, it's been three years. Uh, and, and a lot goes into making that happen. And again, those people I, I recognized earlier, uh, this lady I'll get to in a second, Ms. Dawson beside me, have, have been instrumental in making that happen. And I, I certainly appreciate them. Uh, also, all of our schools, 14 and 15, we were not wireless. Uh, currently now, uh, thanks to E-rate funds, uh, house sales tax, uh, we've been able to make our schools uh, through our federal government funds for E-rate uh, completely wireless. So all of our schools, along with our central office, are completely wireless now. And uh, uh, that's what we're learning is going. Uh, we're not attached to a computer anymore. Uh, technology's mobile. <coughs> we also have digital handbooks within the elementary, uh, middle, and high school. Um, other parts of our transportation Transformational technology, we've placed uh, 47 projectors countywide. Uh, we've added smart TVs, and I'll talk about that and what that looks like in just a bit. Uh, we've, this summer, configured over 1,000 iPads countywide. Uh, and we've rolled out a piece of software co called Mosul, and Danny Sykleather is uh, the head of that. And basically what that allows us to do is not only configure these iPads, but monitor the iPad usage and what's being pushed down to each of those iPads at each of the schools. So now we have a handle on all of our iPads versus each individual person being able to have different names of apps and a piece of software on, on that device. Uh, knowing that we have this many devices out, we've also added a piece of guardian protection software so that we can monitor uh, the Chromebooks and the usage uh, by the classroom teachers and also at the district level as well. Uh, we've added security cameras to an emergency response system to our central office is one of the things I'd like to highly of. Um, I'm also over safety. Uh, this building did not have any way to communicate with the building uh, all at one time. So we've recently added that. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this day and time, uh, it, it's made that necessary. Uh, but I think that, that we've made this building safer for board meetings, also for uh, our people that work here on a daily basis. Our network and infrastructure, uh, we've consolidated physical servers at the central office. Uh, we've also repurposed uh, seven servers uh, throughout the district. And uh, last year, and we did an MCNC network assessment uh, that allowed us, to, uh, an outside entity, to come in and tell us what our strengths, what our weaknesses were, and has given us some feedback and reflection on where we are and what we need to do uh, to stay up to date. I uh, also have new cabling access points at the high school, which I'll talk about here in just a second as well. Uh, currently, through E rate uh, funds, we were able to upgrade our high school. Uh, we knew our access points. We were having some connection uh, connectivity issues over the years. Uh, so we've begun uh, adding new access points to the high school, 134 to be exact. And they'll be Arrow High's uh, access points, which will keep us consistent across the district. All of our schools now will have Arrow High access points, uh, which will give us uh, the ability to monitor all of those here at the central location, one central location. We've also added auditorium lobby, varsity gym lobby, uh, made that wireless. Uh, we've put and had several uh, different staff developments in those areas over the, the past year, and uh, they were not wireless and it's created some issues, so they'll be wireless. Also have additional coverage in varsity gym, uh, JV gym, testing center, band course, and the main lobby. So that school will be up to date and ready to go, we're thinking uh, around December. We've also added new devices throughout our district. We added 27 uh, new LCD panels that we have here in the uh, boardroom, uh, and uh, we've added Dell Optiplex 9, 990s, 27 of those, and projectors and cameras. Um, the CPUs that you see there, the Dell Optiplex, uh, these devices that you see within the boardroom actually have computers on the back of those uh, to run for their information. Uh, we have that hooked to the teacher's desktop to run those boards within uh, the classroom setting. I also spoke of just a little bit ago about smart TVs. We're learning on how we can be as, as smart with our finances as possible. Uh, we're exploring and have added several places uh, TVs uh, with their hook by a Chrome bit, which makes them completely wireless and makes a regular smart uh, flat screen TV uh, into a computer that you can broadcast and display information much like what I'm doing here within the classroom at much lower cost. So uh, really under $1,000, uh, we can equip uh, a classroom Explore new, new possibilities. Uh, technology maintenance, one of the things that we've learned with these new devices.
devices and equipment is you have to keep them up and you have to keep them running. So we have a maintenance uh, program now scheduled. Uh, and that's uh, my crew that I, I talked about earlier. And Ms. Dawson and myself, we get out with our blowers and blow out the CPUs and the projectors and the filters to, to keep them from overheating and hopefully keep them running pop properly. Uh, we've also added two additional technicians uh, to the workforce. And by doing that, adding uh, Zach Kepner, as I mentioned earlier, we consolidated uh, multiple positions to create one Again, trying to be a good steward uh, of our budget and our finances as we move forward. Um, very proud of, of what's taken place. Uh, we are, I believe, moving in the right direction, uh, but we're doing so because we have quality people within our school system. We have quality people within the classrooms that are using our devices properly, and uh, I'm very proud of, of where they're going. Uh, to mention Ms. Dawson, we were able to uh, add her to our staff because we can have all the infrastructure we want. We can have all the devices that we want within a school not promoting digital learning and not teaching teachers to use these devices properly they're teaching the students uh, that I think we're going backwards so we have uh, added the addition uh, to Miss Dawson uh, she's always been a part of our school system we just kind of restructured what she does a little bit and uh, she's incredible and I think she's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, digital learning uh, teaching and learning at this point so thank you so much Um, we wanted to talk about the ACS digital teaching and learning, and I like to say it's not digital teaching and learning, it's just teaching and learning. It's the way we do business. Um, you know, as we have updated all of our devices and we have added more and more devices, it's very important to understand that it's just the way we do business. So, as we look forward this school year, we, um, the state of North Carolina has added new licensure requirements for our teachers, and it really comes down to our CEUs and our renewal credits. So our teachers, as they start to renew in 2019, will be required, and you'll see that on that, that right column, to have two digital learning competency credits, which is the equivalency of 20 hours of CEU credit. Those 20 hours, um, that's basically professional development that they have to have in order to renew their license. That started this year, and the first renewal cycle will be 2019. So how does this affect us? And it is basically we want to see our teachers integrating the North Carolina digital learning competencies. And I want to go ahead and read from these, but high quality integrated digital teacher learning in our classrooms. We want to see um, our teachers grow in their skills as they integrate this, these competencies into their practice. These are not extra. This is just something that aligns with the current teaching standards. We also, um, there is a competencies for our administrators so that they are <coughs> at the building level promoting digital learning and all of this grows our leadership and excellence in digital citizenship. Where are we in this process? So we started in 2016-17 kind of learning about the competencies. We had two groups, actually it seemed more like three or four because I seem to be part of all of them, but there were different groups that were attending different professional development sessions to prepare us for this. So we had um, one group was our digital team for digital, digital learning, district team for digital learning. Sorry, there's a lot of acronyms. And this group um, was, consisted of school-based personnel and district-based personnel, and we attended many workshops, about the equivalency of 60 hours, and it was really to prepare us as we move into implementing the digital learning conference and how going forward that we can set a roadmap for our district. The other group was, um, there were four of us, and we attended the North Carolina Digital Learning Coaching Network. And that was basically to prepare us as we act in a, a mentoring coaching role for our teachers. And those four people, Melinda Glenn from Wittenberg, Andrew Pennell from Sugarloaf, um, Shelly Mitchell from the high school, and me. So looking toward this year, we knew we wanted to do something a little different that gave our teachers basically what they asked for. They asked for professional development that allowed them to stay in their schools, allowed flexibility, and allowed them time to plan. So we gave them that last Monday, and um, from all accounts, it turned out very well. I have gone in, I've looked at some of the lesson plans they've created, uh, not all of them because with 500 different people, it's a little hard to do that, but we have, um, this day was, it was a lot of work and it wasn't just me. It was Dr. Griffin and there were some other um, members of the district who 
all help contribute lesson plans, and we basically created a blend of learning module for our teachers so that they could do some of the work in small groups in their schools, but also online. And it wasn't the seat time or the conference style workshops that they're traditionally um, used to. So it really turned out pretty good. I, I tried to go to all the schools. Um, it was hard. It was hard. I need a, a lot more of me, and but it's okay. We're, we're building human capacity within our schools. Therefore, that you know. So we got our district leader, our school level leaders, like uh, Jill Peaks. You know, she was here earlier with Kim Hertzler. Kim has just done incredible things in her school. Jeanette Botcher is doing incredible things in her school. Um, I know Jamie's over there, and, and Jamie is doing things. You know, um, Jennifer Muscarelli from Taylorsville. So all of our different schools, there's people within these schools that we're building that capacity so that they can also be those digital leaders. And as we look at why we're doing this, um, this quote, our job is not to prepare our students for something. Our job is to help our students prepare themselves for anything. And I feel like that's what the technology is helping us do. If, you know, when I think about when I moved to the high school and where we were and where we are now and the things I see students doing just on a, a daily basis that, you know, small things like video editing and things like putting together these awesome presentations that a couple of years ago we would have had to sit there and hold hands for. It's just, um, you know, they are truly embracing the digital. And so are our teachers. And this is really why it's important is because we do know that post-secondary education, our pe people going into the service, our people who are just going to the community to be employed, the reality is the digital is not going away. Um, it is just more and more, and I would rather students learn how to harness that in a positive way. And so that's our job as a district, is to continue to help our teachers to grow so therefore they can help their students to grow. And I think that's the end of my presentation. So, um, ultimately, I've seen some incredible changes over the last couple of years, and I hope that we will continue to go forward and, and keep encouraging our teachers because they are doing some awesome, awesome things in their classrooms. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Amy, Thank you Amy, real quick. We, um, as a board, we were able to visit East on Friday, and talking about the structure of your PD day on Monday, we saw teachers implementing lesson plans on Friday that they had worked on, they had created those on Monday. That's what we wanted. And uh, so you were, you, it was a success. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And I'll recognize um, Renee Mead for our year in review. <clears throat> First of all, the year in review is for the 16-17 school year, and um, when I sat down and started working on this, it turned out to be 51 pages long. So I did <laughs> not want to make you sit here through all of that. So that prompted a more concise version, which I've titled Quick Facts. Um, and one of the things that I do need to say is that this year in review um, is the work of everybody all of our directors contributed items to be listed in this. And I have to say a, a very special thank you to Teresa Smith and Jean Reed for proofing my documents for me because if you think about 51 pages and then eight more pages for the quick facts, um, that's, that's a lot of proofing. So um, neither the <coughs> review or the quick facts is a comprehensive list of items um, in each of the areas but it's kind of a snapshot, it's a talking point, it's something that you could quickly reference if you were sharing information about our school system. Um, if you will remember, we have the strategic plan, and if you look on the website under our district, you'll see there's a tab for strategic plan, and that's where this is located. Um, and it will remain there. Down the side, you will also see that there is a listing for a year in review, which is the 51 page document. You are welcome to go there and peruse it at your leisure. Um, it was um, a lot of work, but I do have to say that it is um, very encouraging and inspiring to see all the things that are taking place. So I do encourage you to go through and look at those. Now, that brings us to the quick facts, which are these little sheets. I've also put a set in front of you. Um, you can see that they are 
are broken down uh, by each of the priority areas. The first set is the student success, and that was uh, two pages, front and back, or one page front and back. And uh, I'm not gonna go through and read all of that for you, but if you um, look at it, if you have questions, you may need to refer back to either the year in review. And in doing so, I do have to draw your attention <coughs> to when you get to the black, those are the tasks that we have done. Um, not every goal is in here. Not every goal is in here and not every strategy is in here. If things were completed prior to last year, then we just skipped through those and went straight to what we did last year. Um, if this isn't enough for you, you're welcome to go back to the strategic plan and look through those sections because it is much more detailed Lifelong literacy, back to the quick facts. <coughs> um, it is also a front and back piece. Professional excellence. I condense down to just the front page. And then on the back page, you'll see that that is collaborative community. And then we finish up with transformational technology on the front and optimal operations on the back. And those will be posted. I encourage you to look you to share. Um, do you have any questions for me? You did a beautiful you. job. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say thank you for doing this because, you know, we, we know we do a lot of things, but sometimes we forget exactly what we've done as well, a system. And I have to say, a lot of times when I was looking through it, I would have to call and say, did we do this last year or was it, <laughs> you know, because it seems like it was just a few months ago. It's a lot of work, and it is a tribute to all of the work that um, the folks in our school system do. Thank you for doing it. I know it's a lot of work, but I think it's important to recognize the successes. So thank you for putting it together for us. Thank you. It's beautiful. I recognize Dr. Jennifer Hefner for the superintendent's report. The report that I'm about to give you is also attached to your agenda. Uh, tonight we only have six items to discuss, so it's a rather short report. The North Carolina School Board Association's annual conference for board member development is next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, that uh, conference will be held in Greensboro. Vice Chair Scott Bowman, Deborah Watts, and I look forward to the learning opportunities this conference always provides. Secondly, the Sports Hall of Fame tickets are being sold for $30 each. The event is scheduled for Monday, November 20th, beginning at 6 o'clock at McLendon's Restaurant. Tickets can be purchased at a variety of locations, including the Board of Education. Friday is a holiday for students and staff in honor of Veterans Day. I hope everyone in Alexander County takes the time to thank a veteran this week. And I also know that you were invited to a special ceremony at Wittenberg on Wednesday. If you are planning to attend, let me know and I'll notify the school. I do have that on my agenda. I want to take a moment to congratulate our Varsity Cougar football team for clinching the conference championship last Friday at South Caldwell High School. It was a rainy game. Uh, uh, it was a rainy game. <laughs> especially to those like myself uh, who failed to take their umbrellas and ponchos, but uh, it, uh, it was a good game. This was the first varsity football title since 2010 and the seventh conference championship in our school's 48 year history. The first round of the state playoffs, uh, the, the Cavaliers will be playing the Cougars uh, in Cougar Stadium <laughs> Friday evening beginning at 7.30. Admission is $7 per person, and I would just ask you to come out and cheer on our Cougars. We've had such a, a wonderful and exciting season. The Board of Education is scheduled to visit Bethlehem Elementary on Thursday, November 16th, beginning at 1130. We will be treated to lunch and a tour of the facility. 
And again, I would ask you to mark your calendar and make plans to attend that school board visit. And lastly, the parent advisory council meetings at each school have gone very well so far. Dr. Curry and I will finish with these meetings by the middle of November. We're going to compile the data from these focus groups and present the overarching themes to you at the <coughs> December meeting. Work on the new strategic plan will begin in January. And if any of you or all of you would like to help us with that work, please let me know. Uh, your voice uh, would be appreciated in the process. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, great. Thank you. Well, moving on to new business, I would recognize Sharon Mahaffey, our Chief Financial Officer, for the presentation of the 2017-18 draft budget or budget proposal. No policies this time. No. <laughs> Next month. Are you missing them? I miss them. I'd much rather do that than the budget. Um, first of all, I want to thank Bill for um, his help with the, the presentation tonight. Um, I guess I'm going to have to eventually give up Excel and Word and go to Google Docs, but I guess I'm not there yet. So. Uh, we've come tonight to present uh, the Alexander County Schools budget for the 2017-18 fiscal year, and it is not 51 pages. <laughs> the co a copy of the official budget document is at your place tonight. Uh, it's the official document, the one we pass, although it may not be the most helpful to you. Yeah, you probably will find those um, uh, attachments more helpful. This year, the budget totaled 48,000, what is it? 48, 48 million. $102,453. And you can see the way that is from the chart, the way that breaks down in our seven funds. Uh, we faced a de decrease in enrollment again this year of 60 students. A recent study of school funding in North Carolina stated that 85 of the 115 LEAs in the state had a drop in year over year enrollment. The study also states that 23% of all positions in the state were paid from federal or local funds. This slide shows the, the percentage of breakdown in each fund. The state fund is the largest with 64% of the total budget, general expense 15%, child nutrition federal funds and local expenses 6 and 7%, and then capital outlay and child care. This chart shows, a, uh, which we have used before, the salary, <coughs> that salary and benefits are the major expenditures of the school system at 84% of the total budget, and this is up from 81% of last year. This slide illustrates the major differences in the amount of funds used for salaries and operating, salaries and operating expenses. Salaries are $40,503,827 of the $48 million budget. One of the things that we did this year that was a little different was we showed last year's budget, this year's budget, and the difference. I want to caution us to be careful when we do that with state funds because we have, as you've heard me say before, dollar allotments and position allotments. If you look at, the, at um, the teaching allotments for this year, we lost 5.5 positions, but we gained, according to the chart, $211,000 because the state uses the average teacher salary of the state to come up with a dollar figure for those guaranteed allotments. They need a dollar figure to put in their budget because they they have to 
guarantee the dollars. They have to know the dollars. When we use them in our budget, we use the number of positions we have. There are several categories that have um, those guaranteed allotted positions. Of course, the teachers, the non-instructional, I mean, the um, school building administrators, we get months of employment that are guaranteed. Instructional support, we get positions. And career and te technical education, we get months of employment. So if you add up those, along with the increases we got in EC, which must be used for EC students, and the $200,000 in early college, plus the $40,016 that Bill was talking about in E-rate that came for the uh, access points at the high school, you're left with about the increase we got in low wealth. Now, one of the things we talked about in leadership this morning is even in those categories, such as EC, that we get additional funds, we don't necessarily get enough funds, whether it's because the legislature didn't do it or because of declining enrollment, to cover the additional expenses. In other words, it probably cost us more than $128,838 to cover the increases in salary in EC. Insurance alone was over $300 this year. Per person. Yes. This year, we would use this year, in general, the general expense, in the general expense budget, we will use one million one hundred and seventy thousand and twelve dollars in fund balance. You can see from this slide some of the things that caused the increase in fund balance. Last year, we had one hundred and twenty-six thousand dollars in Title II funds that were carried over, and we had to spend them. We used $464,443 in uh, textbook money that um, we had. Uh, the decrease of $150,000 from the county. Retirement in the non-allotted positions, the increase, the 0.8% increase in retirement, cost $98,864. The health insurance increase was $115,672. The certified salary increase in those non-allotted positions was $110,650. And we received a $25,000 cut to the central office. When I walk into a classroom and there's a really good teacher, it's like magic to me. And I don't think that there is enough money in the world to pay for kids having that magic. But teachers have received significant salary increases in the last, significantly deserved salary increases in the last year. When we were looking at the certified salary increases, we had to actually go through person by person and compare their last year's salary with this year's salary. Some of our, our instructional support positions received a $3,000 increase. So that is a big hurdle uh, to overcome. Well deserved, but big. There are some things that, um, well, first of all, uh, the identified increases up there are $1,091,655. We, um, the increase in fund balance from last year was $818,000. We have done some things for, uh, to provide some savings. We parked two buses. We eliminated some teacher positions. We have installed LED lighting for energy savings. We have extended the school uh, day so that we have, when we have snow, we don't have to make up those days, which is the savings on operating buses and, and maintaining the buildings. We moved a significant number of uh, positions to state last year, uh, <coughs> and we saved $12,000 in workers' comp by 
doing that. We also had some um, uh, additional expenditures. We gave back three days to the 10 month non-certified employees that lost days a few years ago. Um, I think that is, is a very good thing. A teacher might drive to Alexander County for a $45,000 a year job because it's a good place to work. Chances are, and in most cases they aren't, people who work in their clerical positions, their TA positions, are the people who pay taxes and vote in Alexander County because you're not going to drive 40 miles a day for a $20,000 a year job. Another thing that we have done is we have expanded the one to one initiative that Bill discussed. <coughs> Let's look at the, vi the visual, if we are a visual person of those, those reductions. The big red reduction is of course the textbook money. The green one is a loss of $150,000 in um, local county funding. At this time, uh, I would like to share that uh, as of June 30th, we had Three million eight hundred seventy thousand five hundred fifty-seven dollars in our fund balance. Um, you can deduct what we project using this year, which will leave us a projected total of two, as of June thirtieth, two thousand eighteen, two million seven hundred thousand five hundred forty-five dollars. And I think that uh, we need to go ahead and just put that out there. Uh, I wanted you all um, to know in my budget message how we jumped from $350,000 using fund balance during 16-17 to $1.17 million this year. <coughs> I wanted to be very transparent about that. Hopefully the, the presentation helped with that as well as my budget message. Do you have any questions at this time? In those uh, losses of, of certified positions, is that close to the same amount that we actually did away with? The, was it five and a half positions, I believe? Is that close to? It was five and a half positions that the state cut us. And right. Harry, when we went back, and some of that's hard to track. I understand. Because that. maybe we didn't fill a position at high school, but we did fill one at the early college right. because their student numbers increased. <coughs> right. We came up with about between three and four positions that we know okay. we so we're really close. An example of that was the PE position that we did not fill and we ended up splitting a position between the two middle schools. Um, and um, so the best we can tell it was probably about four positions versus five and a half. And approximately how many classrooms, now I know this is this is uh, out there, but approximately how many classrooms do we have in the county? Just approximately, I mean, in other words, it'd be hard to, but my point is, my point is, what people need to understand is, if we've lost 65 students, that's going to be way less than one student per classroom, and so it doesn't really affect our teacher need. It only affects what the state says we're going to get money-wise. Well, the thing that I like to do, as far as giving an example, we can lose 60 children, but because they're scattered between a lot of buildings, nothing changes with operating expenses. Exactly. You still have to run your cafeteria. You still have to have the lights on and the water and those kinds of things. You still have to have a principal in every building. So, you know, while enrollment has declined, and that, again, is not a secret either, uh, operating expenses continue to, to remain relatively the same. Those 60 students probably don't even take away one teacher if you tracked it through the, out the entire county. Well, if you did the math, 60 children, roughly, you could say that would equal two teachers. But if they're but taken because, from all different classes. Right, in all, all different over, grade levels, right. that you don't have the luxury of saying, well, we'll pull two teachers at school A. Right. It doesn't work that way. Right. 
And I also think it's important for us to understand that we had the increased funding of 200000 for the early college. In addition to those, that those weren't jobs that were created, those were jobs that moved with those students. So we still had the same amount of state allocation for those students, but we had an increase of 200000 And we were able to pay, I think that we ended up taking two teaching positions as part of that 200000 and that's how we covered two additional positions with that funding. And plus the recovery of low wealth. Of the low wealth, and plus the recovery also of those uh, students that would be going to Challenger yes. that we pull back into our system. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are we still paying on the auditorium? Is that pay off? That debt service does not get paid. Yeah. Now, no, that comes out of the head since sales tax. We have several debts that pay off, and I believe that's the one that pays off in 2018. Other questions? Um, I feel like a rock and roll singer. There's so much <laughs> reverb on that, or whatever you call that ping. Um, you mentioned that some, <clears throat> on average, some employees of the school system received a $3,000 raise, okay, but not every teacher received oh, no. a $3,000 raise, but what every teacher and school employee did receive was an option to go to the 70-30 plan or spend a significant amount more out of their pockets to stay with the 80-20. Now that won't get any headlines along with the Cougar, Varsity, and JV football team's great season. But at, when teachers used to take a job and custodians and maintenance workers, you know, their health insurance benefit was one of those things that kind of kept people employed in the ebb and flow of the market. Um, so that won't make any news. So if it's okay to promote that teachers have been given raises and et cetera, et cetera. But what the general public does not understand, probably in all 100 counties in North Carolina, is the General Assembly, if they approve a pay increase, that doesn't mean they're going to send along the difference to make up for that. It's made up locally. Also, on the local appropriation, most folks don't understand and I'm not going to get into a tirade about where we rank in local funding compared to other systems, but I do wish that folks would research it themselves. In 2001, I believe, was the last time that the school system received an enormous uh, increase, a huge increase, and that had much to do about local supplements because we were losing teachers to other counties because the local supplement here was substantially lower than that of the surrounding counties. <clears throat> so um, the local funding was increased and I would encourage folks to research it yourself. You know, it's, it's not, it's our place to educate children. It's not our place to grovel for money. The general statute makes it real clear we operate schools, we educate children. <coughs> this board, nor any future school board, nor any past board, should have to put the majority of their effort um, and time and gnashing of teeth over 6% of a $48 million budget. That 6% should be relatively easy <coughs> to come by. Really, if you were going to compare it across the state, then really it should be 9 or 10 percent of our budget, if you want to consider all things. <coughs> and thankfully, we have four county commissioners that have prior experience in the school system, and I'm thankful for that. 
so uh, and it has been stated in the past that that we'd never ask for an increase in funding <clears throat> well that day hopefully is going to come to an end real soon yeah. because we're going to ask i hope for an increase in funding um what other folks might not know <clears throat> As you know, they always refer to West Virginia as a poor state. You know, you hear it all the time. And there, there's genuine pockets of poverty in West Virginia. They rank 16th in the United States in per pupil funding. 16th. Kentucky, another place that has significant poverty, they rank 20th in per pupil spending. I can go on, but cut to the chase, North Carolina ranks 43rd. Now last time I checked, we only have 50 states. So you can propose whatever you want to do. But a really wise man that taught me a whole lot, and um, <clears throat> some thought we were adversarial, but I, I think he's one of the smartest men i would ever been around. Norris Kiever was a former two-time commissioner in Alexander County. <clears throat> and he and I would debate a lot. But there's one thing that he said that has stuck with me for 20 plus years. He said, liars can figure, but figures never lie. So if folks will take the time to glean out the facts, not the fluff, the data from the North Carolina Department of Instruction, you can also go to the federal side. You know, somebody had to work long and hard to find out that, you know, North Carolina ranks 43rd in per pupil spending and West Virginia ranks 16th. This data is readily available. And you say, well, well this really doesn't impact me. If you have a son or a daughter or a grandson or granddaughter or a niece or a nephew, <coughs> You get out of life what you put into it. And if our actual effort in Alexander County from a local standpoint is in the bottom 25%, then do you expect them to be number one? I don't think that's realistic. If you're a state that's on the rebound from the recession, their fund balance is growing in Raleigh. You can check it. It's on the state treasurer's website. Alexander County government's fund balance is growing. You can check it. It's on the state treasurer's website. They've increased ad valorem taxes five times. Their fund balance is healthy. School systems can't raise money. All we can do is take our allotment, our 41st place allotment, I might add, and our 6% of our entire budget, local allotment, and do the best we can do. <clears throat> that said, it's pretty clear we have no intention of closing any school because it's not justified. It's real clear that we're going to use our fund balance and we're going to spend it down. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> if we ran our fund balance down below 8%, it's not any school board that's legally responsible for funding the operations of schools general statute makes it clear where that responsibility lies. Our business is to educate children. And we, if we have to deplete our fund balance to do it, then so be it. Mr. Odom, that kind of led into my question because I think we as a board have to come up with a plan and present this and, and ask commissioners. I mean, we, we, we have no choice but to ask for some help. So I guess that's up to us to come up with a way we want to present that. I would recommend that we, we sent our superintendent one time and um, some of the statements that were made, uh, you know, I, I certainly didn't agree with. I, that's no other <coughs> department asking for county dollars has to go up and be subjected to, to that kind of stuff. I, I have prior experience as a board of commission member, and uh, I will publicly state that, that we will not subject our 
superintendent to uh, to the belittling that she took last time. If the whole board has to go, then we just go. I think it was the intention of the budget committee that um, members of the budget committee are Vice Chair Scott Bowman, uh, Harry Shrum, and myself, and uh, we will be making plans to, to discuss with the commissioners um, getting some help because obviously there's been a significant change in circumstance in our financial obligations in the last year and um, as has been stated several times tonight we were told we didn't ask so we're asking so I think we'll be in touch with uh, members of the board um, about how and when that will take place but I would anticipate it would be very soon we've also been in trying to secure some dates um, to to meet with uh, the folks that we're going to be on that funding formula committee with the commissioners and um, we still haven't gotten any feedback on that so we'll reach out and try and try and get some dates pretty quick because it's very apparent that um, unless North Carolina changes the way that they fund schools our county is going to have to change the way that they fund us so that's the direction the budget committee will be going in any, any additional comments? Uh, one additional comment regarding health care costs. Besides the additional burden to the employee um, from the recession forward, 2009 forward, uh, the health care per person has increased over $1,200. Mm -hmm. And when you say, well, what's $1,200? You have to add that $1,200 per employee plus the amount they spend out of their their uh, check uh, to cover dependents, etc. So it's pretty significant. I also know from, I uh, just want to say from the uh, discussions during the, the policy, uh, budget committee meetings that we are running about as thin as we can. Um, I'm sure everybody in here knows that. We're consolidating positions. People are wearing multiple hats. Um, so it's not like we ha there's fluff. We don't have any fluff. If there ever was fluff in the school system, um, it wasn't wasn't this one. <laughs> so I think we're at a, at a critical point where the, 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 this board will have to, to make some, some requests and um, hopefully we'll be able to work something out. And, and our pay will remain the same at $120 a month. <laughs> Just a little All trivia. Right. I need, uh, unless there's any other discussion, we need to take action. Mr. Pennell, did you have anything you want to add? Mr. Bowman, either <coughs> one? Okay. All right, I need, we need to take action on the budget. Um, you all have had a chance to look at it, and um, thank you for the presentation, uh, Mr. Happy. I'll need a motion to approve the budget as presented. Motion to approve. Second. Um, I've got a motion and a second. Any additional discussion on this? Those in favor of approval of the budget as presented, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Now I need a <coughs> motion to go into closed session. So moved. Uh, hang on, I gotta read the number. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta read the statute. 143-318-11 sub A sub 6. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. We're gonna go into closed session.